Under Western eyes, what does Zizek want? When I had delivered a lecture on Hitchcock at an American campus, a member of the public asked me indignantly, how can you talk about such a trifling subject when your ex-country is dying in flames? My answer was, how is it that you in the USA can bear to talk about Hitchcock? Slavoj Zizek, The Metastases of Enjoyment, 1994 a Lacanian subject. It must be said straight away, Slavoj Zizek is no Lacanian. If he were, not only would he be furnishing the master's text with the sort of commentaries scholars usually give to biblical exegeses, he would also be unlikely to retain our attention for very long. Rather, Zizek is a Lacanian subject. The difference is not negligible. Having long ago activated within himself and then turned outward the peculiar structure of the Lacanian psyche, Zizek seems now in possession of a formidable instrument of cognition, a laser-like intelligence that cuts through layers of ideological tissue, revealing malignant growths, but also unsuspected connections all over the body politic. Another way of putting it is to say that Zizek has honed to a needlepoint the paranoid dialectic practiced by Jacques Lacan, extending it into two areas the master wisely refrained from occupying, namely philosophy and cultural theory. The latter may not take much courage, though more skill than is usually credited to the practitioners by their detractors. But to have elevated paranoia to a philosophical discourse is no small achievement. Zizek would argue, I think rightly, that he is simply taking up a tradition, that of the philosophy of mind, consciousness and self-consciousness, which might lead one to identify him first and foremost as a Hegelian, who has come to the teachings of Jacques Lacan via Alexandre Kojev and Louis Althusser. But this could be a misunderstanding. Of course, it is true that Zizek knows his Hegel, and he knows his Marx, and he makes approving nods in the direction of those who in recent years have tried to reread Hegel in order to rescue his notion of Aufhebung from its notoriety as the worn-out piston of a 19th-century engine room historical necessity, reinstating its relevance for a contemporary way out of the collapse of binarisms. But perhaps surprisingly, Zizek's master philosopher is in fact Immanuel Kant, and in particular, his metaphysical foundations of morals, which preserve a negativity, the force of an injunction and a finitude which Spinoza's subspecie eternitatis wanted to do away with. Zizek's other philosophical points of reference are Schlegel and Kierkegaard, what we might think of as the tradition diametrically opposed to Hegel. At the same time, it is equally clear that Zizek's ontological ethical project distances itself forcefully from the Nietzsche, Heidegger, Derrida triad as it has dominated continental philosophy for the past 30 years, while also examining, and finding them wanting in both ethics and political philosophy, the deconstructivists' partners in transatlantic dialogue, for instance, Richard Rorty's neoliberal pragmatism or John Rawls's distributive justice. But what interests me here is Zizek, the theorist and cultural critic. As a Lacanian subject, he is totally aware of the other, knowing that he can only constitute himself as subject in the field of an other. The various manifestations of this other and the many configurations of the symbolic order we call our social reality, give Zizek his foremost theme. Indeed, it sometimes seems his only theme. And among the various contested territories where the other manifests itself to the Lacanian subject, there is one that Zizek has privileged access to. This field is the one which we, the West, the liberal democracies living under capitalism, at once constitute and occupy, and against which the East, Central Europe, the post-communist world, the deliberate speaking positions of Zizek's discourse, have, since the fall of the wall, attempted to become subjects. Thus, Zizek has fashioned for his speaking self a complex and oddly representative subjectivity, an instrument that registers many of the fine tremors or gaping fault lines that today traverse our political and intellectual culture. In other words, Subtending his books is a geopolitical but also temporal divide across which he addresses us. And this divide informs everything he says. It is what gives his words both their energy and their urgency, their slightly shocking cheekiness and, at times, desperate irony. Yet Zizek also knows that far from being an impediment to communication, 
It is this divide that assures him of our attention, because both named and erased, it exerts a considerable fascination on us. So, in almost all his books, and invariably right at the start, there is an answer, in the form of a question. Why was the West so fascinated by the collapse of communism? Or, I would like to begin by calling into question the hidden implications of the request made of me to give a report on recent ethnic conflicts in the exotic place I come from, Slovenia. Questions by which he teasingly lets us know that he knows why we are so fascinated by him, why we have made him into such a star on the academic lecture and conference circuit. Zizek, no doubt, delivers. Even as he deconstructs the nature of our interest in Central and Eastern Europe, he satisfies our curiosity about what, and how, some of the intellectuals behind the former Iron Curtain are thinking, and whether they have been hibernating all these years. Yet what Zizek gives us is not an ideological critique of Stalinism, no account of its economic failure, its ideological bankruptcy, its human cost, or other stories of victimization. Rather, Zizek tells us of its success, especially its success in libidinally binding so many individuals for such a long time to its undeniable but utterly psychopathological monstrosity. As we read Zizek explaining why, once the war was down, the whole Stalinist terror bureaucracy crumbled so quickly and totally, part of our thrill derives from watching the process of Stalinist zombies come back to life, mutate into nationalists, then merge and morph back into communists. Knowledgeable about totalitarian make-belief, Zizek, however, also knows only too well what it means to have the eyes of the West upon him. At one point he quotes Kurt Vonnegut, We are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful what we pretend to be. As he gratifies a moral and intellectual curiosity, he no doubt considers to be partly pornographic, we want to see the other's desire, as well as literally obscene, our media's need to pull into the limelight all kinds of local and regional politics that had for decades remained off stage. he not only detests the demands we make on him, he also, ever so politely, reads us the riot act on them, for the desire we are so keen to see in the citizens of Central and Eastern Europe is their desire for us. Perhaps not literally, as in a porn film or with a prostitute, but similar enough in structure, the desire for our consumer goods, our freedoms, our democracy. And while we patronize this desire, we are also gratified by it, because we know that such a desiring other is safe, comfortable in the knowledge that what they desire does not threaten us. We have plenty of consumer goods, business advisors, and experts to sell them, since they simply want to catch up with us. We look at them with generous benevolence. After all, they want our past as their future. More than that, through their eyes we can enjoy the innocence of our own past, making them the perfect object of our sentimentality, our nostalgia. For we can love in them the wide-eyed child of democracy we once were. Thus, in answer to why we were at first interested in what was happening in Eastern Europe, Zizek replies that the East's political and economic reforms allow us once more to inspect our own value system, in which we have lost all faith or conviction, liberal democracy and free market capitalism. However, not least with the civil war in the former Yugoslavia, that situation has changed, bringing Zizek to the bitter conclusion that the emergence of ethnic causes broke the narcissistic spell of the West's complacent recognition of its own values in the East. Now Eastern Europe is returning to the West the repressed truth of its democratic desire. And as in the First World War's hurrah patriotism, when the left could only look on in passive fascination because the working classes couldn't get to the front lines fast enough, now Western Europe, faced with all the nationalisms and fundamentalisms, can only wring its collective hands. The kernel of enjoyment being precisely what remains the same in many a transition from one paradigm or episteme to another, in this case from totalitarian rule to the new societies, or from the evil empire to our partners in the East. Zizek obliges us to recognize a point he never tires of making. We enjoy the other only when he consents to either mirroring us or to playing the victim. Woe to him who shows us his desire when it's no longer constructed in our image.
Zizek indelicately points out the peculiar logic by which one country's freedom fighters become another country's terrorists, or today's victims become tomorrow's fundamentalist fanatics. We, after all, know where to draw the line. Zizek himself is more circumspect. He speaks our language, speaks our problems. He tickles and at the same time thrashes our narcissism, refusing to play the role we have allocated to messengers from Eastern Europe, to plead with us for sympathy, for understanding, for compassion. At the same time, Mephisto-like, he seems to know us better than we know ourselves by speaking to us about all the problems that give us fitful dreams, the new racisms and political correctness, fundamentalism and the aesthetics of violence, identity politics and the culture of complaint. Between satisfying our curiosity and castigating it, Zizek keeps us fascinated, aware that he is the first post-89 theorist to address post-68 pessimists, giving a political reading that doesn't use the language of politics, but of philosophy and psychoanalysis. Thus the master trope of Zizek's discourse, but also the fulcrum which gives it leverage, is the gaze to which he feels himself exposed as he speaks about a historical experience we have barely begun to look in the face. What can one say, he seems to ask, to the patronizing gaze from the right, complacently mistaking the Velvet Revolutions as a vote for themselves, and to the fascinated gaze on the left, wanting to hear that the dissidents should have held on to socialism, or looked for the third way. Exposed to this most powerful of Althusserian interpolations, which construct for him a seemingly ineluctable double bind, Zizek compares the East as it used to be, official obeisance, private cynicism, to the West as it has always been. Officially we're free, privately we obey, and because our cynicism is empty, we only function through our conformism. He then finds that they have much in common, and comes to the ironic conclusion that the enemy is not the fundamentalist, but the cynic. Fortunately, he doesn't leave it there, but via what looks like an extended detour, tries to break open this double bind, by holding up a mirror, Medusa's mirror perhaps, so that we might recognize a more painful truth about ourselves in its anamorphic representations. Learning from Hollywood the movies are not fooled. Zizek has had no trouble recognizing these Western eyes upon him, constituting him as a subject and robbing him of his desire. This gaze is analyzed at length in Lacan's Écrit, but it also traverses the work of Alfred Hitchcock. Before commenting on this further, apropos a book edited by Zizek that makes precisely this connection, in English, Everything you always wanted to know about Lacan, but were afraid to ask Hitchcock, and in German, Ein Triumph des Blicks über das Auge. I want to ask why the mirror he holds up to us is popular culture, or more specifically, the movies. While citing them all the time, nowhere, as far as I am aware of, does Zizek justify his references to the cinema, say, in the way that Siegfried Krakauer in From Caligari to Hitler made a case for reading the movies of the Weimar Republic as the manifestation of a knot of fears, desires, and premonitions, making the German soul toss and eventually turn towards totalitarianism. And yet, when T.W. Adorno emigrated to the U.S., he used his traumatic experience of fascism as a kind of probe in order to interpret and indict American popular culture and Hollywood, in the famous culture industry, mass culture as mass deception chapter of Dialectic of Enlightenment. Although no refugee in this sense, Zizek too attaches extraordinary cultural weight to the movies, and one might be forgiven for drawing a parallel between him and these members of the Frankfurt School when one sees what good use Zizek makes, for instance, of the Lacanian Between Two Deaths or The Two Fathers in order to illuminate at one time Stalinism and at another Hollywood movies. And yet, not only the conceptual framework where Lacan can meet Hitchcock, but also the purpose for which Zizek has recourse to cinema in the first place, is so different from Adorno's that one hesitates to pursue the analogy any further. It is precisely because Zizek probably started with the same question as Adorno, namely, how could so many accommodate their libidinal economy to a totalitarian regime 
that their answers are so far apart. While Adorno, reflecting on mass culture and fascism, which only lasted 12 years, could still believe in a kind of heroic resistance and refusal by assuming ideology and the psyche to be similarly structured, Zizek's view is both more tragic and more enlightened after seeing what 50 years of Soviet-style totalitarianism could do to break up any correlation between ideology and subjectivity. In his analysis of East European dissidents, the difference between Vaclav Havel and Milan Kundera, for instance, Zizek is able to redefine resistance and opposition in a way that makes much of the Frankfurt School's ideological critique of the culture industry obsolete. The question thus remains, what precisely can philosophy, politics, and culture learn from Hollywood? Perhaps, after architecture has learnt from Las Vegas, the problem no longer poses itself. In the slipstream of postmodernism, we have all accepted as irrelevant not only the distinction between high culture and popular culture, but also that between popular culture and commercial culture, a distinction on which cultural critics as far apart as Adorno and Raymond Williams had put much weight. Or is it that Zizek sees in the very superficiality and commercial opportunism of popular culture a certain truth, one indicating that the unconscious is not something deep and hidden, but plays on the surface of the social text? More polemically, Zizek does have a theory of popular culture, though neither a sociological nor a postmodern one. It turns partly on the notion of enjoyment, jouissance, and partly on the idea of the truth of error. The cinema, it would seem, allows Zizek to make a number of distinctions, having, in The Sublime Object of Ideology, dismantled the traditional notion of ideology as deception or illusion, in short, as a problem of perception, he turns what he calls the representationalist paradigm on its head by suggesting that especially in the cinema, we always have ideology as fantasy frame underpinning as well as placing ideology as discourse the former not only impervious to even the most well-founded ideological critique or deconstructive reading, but also never fooled by ideology in the first place. On the contrary, it is those who utter ideological critiques in the name of authoritative non-error who are most thoroughly duped by it, according to the famous Lacanian pun, les non dupes errons. Try saying that in fluent French. The fantasy frame, on the other hand, is one of the symptoms of enjoyment, that key term of Zizek's, around which his whole theory of culture ultimately turns, at once secreted, or do I mean X, by and exceeding ideology. Enjoyment, as the laughter of derision, but also the unbearable, unrepresentable core of psychic existence, obliges Zizek to make, via the cinema, a second distinction, that between, bluntly speaking, collective ideology, individual identity, and subjectivity, or, in more Lacanian terms, to renegotiate the relation between the imaginary and the symbolic in favor of investigating, ever so tentatively, the much more terrifying relation between the imaginary and the real. For anyone familiar with contemporary film theory, such use of Lacan for a critique of ideological criticism is not without irony. More obvious than either the Frankfurt School or postmodernism, as the link connecting Zizek with the movies, is indeed Lacan, and in particular his distinction between the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. A triad, or rather a triangular geometry of displaced and superimposed binary pairs, crucial in Lacan for understanding both the structure and the ontogenesis of consciousness. Thanks to the notion of the mirror stage and the importance attributed in it to the look, Lacan's theory of the formation of subjectivity, i.e. how human beings enter into the symbolic order, such as language, or experience themselves as separate individuals in the sphere of the interpersonal, has had an enormous impact on film theory since the 1970s. At first sight, Zizek seems to follow quite closely French and Anglo-American film theory's approach to the so-called classical cinema, especially the films of the 1940s and 50s, the critical focus being on deconstructing cinematic realism, narrative, and gender. Interminably analyzed in these Lacanian categories of the subject, Hollywood melodramas and musicals, western and detective thrillers, seem to confirm Althusser's notion of ideology as interpolation, and Lacan's theory of the imaginary as the subject's necessary miscognition of itself. But Zizek's approach is cleverer than that. After more than a decade of the mirror phase, of voyeurism, 
scoptophilia and fetishism, with film scholars exhaustively discussing the male gaze and wondering why women still enjoy going to the movies when they can only be the object of this gaze, Zizek starts elsewhere, or at any rate, he complicates this simple structure of seeing seen, of looking and being looked at. Although not the first to do so, he mounts his oblique critique by returning to Lacan and his cardinal distinction, so often conflated in psychosemiotic film theory, between the look and the gaze. For Lacan, as for Zizek, look and gaze are placed asymmetrically to each other in the sense that the gaze is always on the side of the object, marking the point in the picture from which the subject viewing it is already being gazed at, far from assuring the self-presence of the subject, i.e. the gaze as instrument of mastery and control. The gaze introduces an irreducible split. I can never see the picture at the point from which it is gazing at me. The eye is thus always already observed, essay est percipi, but with that extra dimension into which the first look and the second look are folded, an enfolding of looks that induces a kind of ontological vertigo, making us doubt not what we see, but the very possibility of there being a place from which to look. With this critique of the gaze and the look, Zizek is able to reread classical cinema in a subtly different but decisive way. Hitchcock, for instance, becomes the director whose work constantly opposes the gaze, invisible, and the eye, the over-elaborated mise-en-scene of characters looking and being looked at, the latter serving to dissimulate the former until that crucial point, the moment of the uncanny, when the sheer force of the gaze overwhelms the eye, exposing it to an almost unbearable terror. The eye looks, but cannot see. Mindful of Zizek's half-ironic, half-paranoid thematization of his own position under Western eyes, as in the passage at the beginning, one can understand more clearly why there are mainly two kinds of cinema that interest him, the films of Hitchcock, and those tales of male paranoia and narcissism, which, for lack of a better word, we have come to call the film noir genre. It is not, however, the cult figure of Humphrey Bogart in a trench coat and fedora pulled over his eyes that interests Zizek. Rather, it is as if, in order to get his bearings, Zizek is reconstructing the vantage point, or more accurately, the vanishing point, which can catch our post-Cold War vertigo, and arrest that sense of being sucked into deep space as he leaves the compression chamber not of Stalinist ideology, but of Stalinist subjectivity. This vanishing point, at the far end of the picture plane, so to speak, is the West's own post-modern, post-Oedipal subjectivity, in the sense we have now defined it, suspended between look and gaze, shattered between paranoia and narcissism. Zizek finds in the new Hollywood, in the post-classical cinema of David Lynch, The Elephant Man, Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks, Ridley Scott, Alien, Blade Runner, Martin Scorsese, Taxi Driver, The Last Temptation of Christ, Cape Fear, and Alan Parker, Angel Heart, Seek. Its genealogy, however, goes back to Hitchcock, Notorious, Vertigo, Rear Window, The Birds, and to the hard-boiled detective gangster films, The Big Sleep, Farewell, My Love, The Big Clock, behind which stands Raymond Chandler, and beyond him, Herman Melville, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Baudelaire, and Franz Kafka. In short, the American male as American psycho, Stalinist and modernist, Europe's and also Zizek's, mon frère, mon semblable. Before me are the English and German editions of what you always wanted to know about Lacan, but were afraid to ask Hitchcock. As it happens, their respective covers summarize rather accurately the difference between two ways of theorizing the cinema according to Hitchcock. The German edition, published in Vienna, sports a green cover with a narrow vertical slit through which we can discover a black and white photo on which Alfred Hitchcock is peering at us, astride a ridiculous mountain bike. In the English edition, published in New York and London, the piercing stare of Jacques Lacan extrudes a series of concentric circles made up of the words, but we're afraid to ask Hitchcock, spiraling outwards towards us, then downwards, finally moving in close to the right ear of Hitchcock, who seems to be in the process of being strangled by his own left hand. Clearly, the German cover reproduces the idea of Hitchcock's as, above all, a voyeur's cinema, 
and the cinematic apparatus constructed as a camera obscura in which the world is mirrored as an illusionist trick, thanks to a cranking, peddling mechanism of transport and transmission. Let's call it Film Theories Hitchcock. The English cover, by contrast, invites a rather fuller exegetic treatment to be read both literally and figuratively, allegorically and anagogically. Literally, the script spiraling outwards links these two heads as though suggesting that if you squeeze or press Hitchcock hard enough, out comes the lesson of Lacan. Alternatively, one might say that the cover shows how that popular and easily accessible entertainment which is the cinema is about to be strangled by one of the most oblique and, as some would claim, obscurantist thinkers, and thus allegorizing the threat of high theory for low culture. In whichever case, Hitchcock and the cinema become a kind of semantically crowded textual and visual surface on which a number of theoretical motifs form interpretable arabesques. Let's call it Zizek's Hitchcock. American Psycho In order to understand what Zizek means by Hitchcock and film noir, we therefore have to see these terms in such a semantic field where they function as both complement and contrast to each other. A number of linked complexes make up this field, ultimately centred on the figure of the father, if we remain within the edible terminology of Freud and Lacan or, more generally, the symbolic order, the big other, in Zizek's terms, in which subjectivity regulates itself. The word psycho gives a clue to one aspect of the complex. For Hitchcock's psycho might be said to be the single most important film to have articulated this subjectivity already back in the 1950s. Turning the tough guy of the hard-boiled thriller inside out, it ushered in a cinema of sex, murder, and the serial killer, of the psychopath and seemingly gratuitous or senseless violence, making Hitchcock the director of A World Out of Joint, with no one in sight to set it right. At least Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe gave the semblance that, down those mean streets where a man must go, not only death, but also self-knowledge might lie in wait. One trait, therefore, that differentiates Hitchcock from film noir is what Zizek calls the big other's benevolent ignorance, as it refers to Hitchcock, and between two deaths, as it applies to film noir. The latter, one finds in Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity, Tay Garnett's The Postman Always Rings Twice, or Rudolf Maté's DOA, Dead on Arrival, three films using the typical film noir convention of voiceover and flashbacks, to signal a hero who, at the end of his quest, instead of being reconciled to his symbolic community, stereotypically the final kiss leading to marriage, is unable to represent himself to himself, and thus to symbolize himself. Effectively, he dies twice over, physically, and in the minds of those who might remember him. Without a consistent identity in the field of the big other, society, peer group, posterity, he has recognized, as Zizek puts it, that the game is already over, when, for us, his life, the film, is just beginning. The Big Other's benevolent ignorance is the counterpart to the noir hero's sense of doom. It is at work in such typical Hitchcock scenes as the election meeting in The 39 Steps, the Nazi society ball in Sabotage, the auction scene at Christie's in North by Northwest, or the final escape of Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman from Claude Rains' mansion in Notorious. In each case, the hero and his adversary try to score against one another in full view of an audience which does not know, must not know, what is truly at stake in the confrontation. Protagonist and antagonist have to execute their moves so as to preserve appearances and be covered by the etiquette of polite society. Three kinds of looks are involved. That of the hero making the move, his opponent who clearly recognizes the move's meaning, but you can only observe it helplessly. And thirdly, the ignorant other, the bystanders and members of the public. The structural condition of this interplay is not only the other's ignorance, but its benevolence, i.e. the fact that the social fabric is still intact. For us spectators, bearers of the fourth look, enveloping them all, the fact is, of course, a fiction. And we remain, alternating between laughter and horror, suspended in ethical and ontological midair.
As soon as the big other, however, loses its benevolence and assumes features of a hostile or paranoid agency, we are in the world of noir, or rather, in the 1980s, revivals of noir. The world of the Tyrell Corporation, Blade Runner, Hannibal Lecter, The Silence of the Lambs, and Frank, the evil genius of Blue Velvet. Hitchcock films like Psycho and the Birds are precisely on the cusp of this mutation in the status of the big other, its failings balance between seeming comic and sinister. In the new noir universe, however, the adversaries have become nothing but sinister. Constrained neither by their inherent evil, an unstoppable and seemingly indestructible life or intelligence, nor by the symbolic order, these creatures become indistinguishable from the big other, whose presence is signaled neither by benevolence nor ignorance. Only indifference still frames events, which is the very absence of frame and gaze. If in the 1970s paranoia thrillers starring Robert Redford, Warren Beatty, or Dustin Hoffman, e.g. All the President's Men, Three Days of the Condor, The Parallax View, a suitably ambiguous father figure would still emerge. Deep Throat, or seasoned hero villains like Max von Sydow, anticipating Donald Sutherland in JFK. One looks in vain for them in such neo-noir classics as Terry Gilliam's Brazil, or Joel and Ethan Cohen's Blood Simple. The other pertinent trait in the oscillation between Hitchcock and film noir is what Zizek calls the trouble with Harry, after the Hitchcock film of that title, a black comedy set in a small town where a dead body gives rise to farcical complications, as everyone suspects everyone else of having had reason to kill the unfortunate victim of a heart attack. As in Twin Peaks, David Lynch's neo-noir television soap opera, it is this very network of presumptions, of guilt, of complicity, of crime and corruption, that keeps the community together, an idyll of donuts and coffee, beyond good and evil, disturbed only when an outsider, Detective Dale Cooper, is still brazen enough to want to get at the truth. Psycho was already less the confrontation of an idyll, the hotel lovemaking, with its dark underside, the motel shower murder, than a film about average American alienation, of furtive lunchtime sex, of egregiously vulgar wealth and white-collar crime. In the fatal encounter between Marion Crane, Janet Lee, and Norman Bates, Anthony Perkins, the hysteria of everyday capitalist life is confronted not with cathartic release, but meets an even darker, psychotic reverse side. However, this reverse is less the nightmare of pathological crime than a world that has embalmed the rituals of rural life that still rigidly clings to the moral and ideological precepts of the American dream. When everyone else has long since accommodated to flouting the law, practicing double standards, or getting by with barefaced cynicism. What is so decisive about Psycho is that the process whereby the intersubjective public space of discourse loses its transparency can be observed in status nascendi and step by step. Gradually, the neutrality of the symbolic order as the ultimate guarantee for any sense of reality, however provisional it may have been, gives way. The ground caves in, like the swamp behind the Bates Motel into which Marion's car disappears. The true noir world starts just beyond this point, where such irony is Norman Bates's attentiveness to clean sheets and solicitousness about freshly cut sandwiches has ceased to be irony and becomes quite clearly that mad supplement, the thing, that fantasy Zizek calls the kernel of enjoyment, to which shreds of the symbolic order are still attached, senseless and contextless, and yet essential in order to hold our subjectivity in place. Zizek here returns to the register of the visual and visuality, calling these moments anamorphoses, in analogy to Lacan's famous description of Hans Holbein's painting The Ambassadors, where a light smudge, like a blur or a shadow, conceals a death's head drawn so obliquely as to lose its representational identity, unless viewed, not subspecie aeternitatis, as one would expect from a memento mori, but sideways and from the ground up. The stain, the blot, the oblique angle, lead Zizek to argue that for the post-Cartesian subject, the normal world only functions because something, the symptom, the synthome, is lodged at the heart of it. Yet it is to this thing that we necessarily have an anamorphic relationship, be it of enjoyment, horror, violence, the nature of which Hollywood movies and popular culture are not only 
not duped about, but, according to Zizek, are singularly prescient and astute about. This gives me the clue to a further examination of the cover of Everything You Always Wanted to Know. The spiral now runs from philosophy to popular culture, but also in the inverse direction. Not just high theory explaining the movies, but popular culture speaking a truth about philosophical motifs, even where it appears to be most farcical or gruesome. Figuratively, what becomes important about the spiral is the reversible or quasi-palindromatic quality of the title. But it is the piercing eye and cusped hand of Lacan turning into the ear of Hitchcock, strangling himself, that provides perhaps the most suggestive reverberations for our theme. You never speak. Look from where I listen. See you. Were two of Lacan's most famous dicta, so that, on this cover, Lacan and Hitchcock, neither knowing or caring about each other, nevertheless constitute themselves as the other's other. Reading the cover anagogically, they suggest that across this gap of their mutual ignorance, they make each other into subjects, thus allegorically reproducing the process whereby the Lacanian subject, Zizek, communicates with the Hitchcockian subject, American Psycho. Having thus started with Zizek's Hitchcock, I seem to have arrived at Hitchcock's Zizek, whose re-subjectivized Psycho can now lend us his eyes to look afresh at Eastern Europe, and in particular at what we have always wanted to know, but were afraid to ask Zizek. Bosnia. Next time, instead of asking that fatal question, how can you talk about Hitchcock, we will demand, tell us more about Hitchcock, knowing that the subject he analyzes will be himself looking at us, so that we can look with Western eyes at an other, which is and isn't, our brother, our likeness. <laughs>